See you've decided to join us tonight. A tale of integration, the likes of which has never been seen in this land before. Truly a treat. Okay, what's up guys? We're back. We're talking about working with integrals. So now that we've got the fundamental theorem of calculus down, now that we've got it ready to go, we can start to investigate integration and its many applications. So in this section, we're just going to discuss the role of symmetry and in integrals. We're going to get an idea of how symmetry interacts with the notion of area we've come up with. And we're going to use this little slice and sum strategy to define the average value of a, of a function. So the gist of it is that something to do with the area should tell us something about the average. That is, the area under a curve and, you know, the net area or something like that, this should tell us something like the average value of the function in some sense that we're going to make very precise. Basically, how high and low the function goes, how much it varies, somehow is captured by the area under the curve. And we're going to explore the theoretical implications of this concept, including a very nice generalization, really in a lot of ways a restatement of something we saw earlier, the mean value theorem. We'll get a mean value theorem for integrals. So sounds like fun, seems super cool, let's try it out. Okay, so as promised, let's start it off just by talking a little bit about the integrals of even and odd functions. So we're going to let a be a positive real number, and we're going to take f to be a function that's integrable, able to be integrated, on the interval from minus a to a. So this interval is symmetric about 0. It goes you know, from like negative 2 up to 2, or negative 5 up to 5, something like that negative a up to a, where a is some number, a positive real number. So if f is even, and just recall here, an even function is a function for which f of minus x is equal to f of x, then the definite integral from minus a to a of f of x dx is just 2 times the definite integral from 0 to a of f of x dx. This makes good sense. Just think of a function that is symmetric about zero. So the gist here is that if f of minus x is f of x, then we're looking at something that looks a little bit like, let's draw a quick picture. So we'll grab you know, our x-axis or y-axis. We'll have fun with it. Keep, it. keep it real. There we go. And let's just draw a function that looks kind of symmetric-y. I don't know, maybe something like that. Not perfect, but close enough for our purposes. And if we look at the area from one side to the other, 
So maybe here we've got, oh, I don't know, maybe this is A and this is minus A. I've got two chunks. I've got chunk one, I've got chunk two, and the total area is just, you know, two times the area in one of the chunks. So I could just take one of the areas here, and that's going to be the same as, and let me use a slightly different color actually, that should be the same as this area over here. So what I'm trying to say is that these guys here have the same area. So the total area is just twice one of those guys' areas. That's all that this here is saying. That's what this is saying. Okay, so even functions on a domain, on an interval that's symmetric about zero, can be, the, the integral of an even function on a domain that's symmetric about zero can be computed just by doing the integral on half the domain and doubling it. Just as easily, we could also say that this guy's equal to two times the definite integral from minus a to zero of f of x dx. So there you go. It all works out very well. It works out super good, real easy, cool. What about odd functions? So remember that if f is an odd function, that is if f of minus x is equal to minus f of x, then the definite integral from minus a to a of f of x dx is zero. So this is actually a pretty cool result. What this is saying, it's basically the exact opposite of the other one, just because integrals are measuring net area, what we're finding out here is that if you have something that looks like, oh, let's try to see if we can draw a nice example or something. Here's our function, it's doing something. And uh, if I, let's get some opacity, there we go. If I'm calculating the net area from a to minus a, where here I am taking this guy to be something like minus a and this one to be a. My function here is odd because when I go into negative values, I'm just picking up the same values I had on the positive side, but now they're negative. They're just flipped by a sign. What this is saying is that the area down here cancels out the area up here. So, because we're measuring net area, these guys have the same total area, if you want to use the phrase total area, um, but they have opposite signs when we consider the net area. So basically it's saying that the part above the x-axis and below the graph is exactly as big as the part below the x-axis and above the graph. So the net area comes out to be zero. So cool, even in odd functions, let us take definite integrals and on appropriate domains, that is on domains intervals that are symmetric about zero, things like minus a to a, they let us evaluate definite integrals very easily. Even in odd functions behave well. And just as a quick reminder, an even function just doesn't care about minus signs. An odd function just takes the minus signs and throws them out front. And unlike numbers, not every function is either even or odd. A function can be neither even nor odd. A function that doesn't do either of these things. All right, cool. Let's try an example or two. Okay, so here we are with an example. Example 10. Let's evaluate the definite integral from minus two to two of x to the fourth minus three x to the third dx. So the first thing we're gonna to wanna to notice here is that we've got a domain that is extremely amenable to using properties of symmetry, or the symmetry of our function. However, the big, the big catch here is that x to the fourth minus three x to the third is neither even nor odd. So theorem six doesn't get applied directly. We can't just use the result we talked about. However, and this is, this is where even and odd functions get their name, x to the fourth, that's x to an even power. It's an even function. And x to the third, 
that's x to an odd power. It's an odd function. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take the integral, we're going to split it up, and then we're going to use symmetry. So we got to do a little bit of pre-processing to put it in the right form to use theorem 6. But this isn't really too big of a hassle. We've been doing this for a while. It's not too bad. So we just start out with our integral right here. Integral from minus 2 to 2 of x to the 4th minus 3x to the 3rd dx. And we split it up into the definite integral from minus 2 to 2 of x to the 4th dx minus 3 times the definite integral from minus 2 to 2 of x to the 3rd dx. So we just look at what we got and hey, this guy right here, this first part, this guy is the integral on a symmetric domain about 0 of an even function. We can just integrate it on half the domain and double our answer. So we'll get out 2, oops, we'll get out 2 times the definite integral from 0 to 2 of x to the fourth dx. That is, we cut out half of the domain and we just double our answer. This will be convenient because it's easier to plug 0 in to x to the fourth than it is to plug in minus 2. Kind of nice. On the other hand, when we take the definite integral from minus 2 to 2 of x to the third dx, we're integrating an odd function on a domain that is symmetric about 0. So we'll get out 0. 3 times 0 still 0, so that just turns into 0. And hey, now all we have to do is evaluate a much simpler integral. Okay, cool. So we get from this 2 times the definite integral from 0 to 2 of x to the fourth dx, we just get using the power rule, 2 times x to the fifth over 5 evaluated from 2 to 0. Cool. So all we do is we plug in that top number, put a minus sign, and we plug in the bottom number. So 2 times 2 to the fifth over 5 minus 0 to the fifth over 5, that's just 2 to the sixth over 5. And as we all know, 2 to the sixth is 64. So we get 64 over 5, and that's our final answer pretty dang smooth. Let's try another one. Let's see how it goes. Okay, here we are with another one. Example 11. Let's evaluate the integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of cosine of x minus 4 times sine cubed x dx. So, what do we have here? Well, we got an integral on a domain that's symmetric about 0, and then we've got some function and a dx. Okay, so this function, well, once again, it's not either an even, or it's neither an even nor an odd function. However, each piece, each component relative to addition and subtraction is, since we can break up a definite integral across sums and differences, we can pull out constant multiples, this will be nice. We can always break something like this up into pieces that are even and odd. That is, if you have a function that is a sum of even and odd function or a, or a difference of even and odd functions, then when you integrate it on a symmetric domain about zero, you can just break it up using the linearity of the integral, and that's really nice and convenient. It makes everything a lot easier. So we look at our pieces. Cosine of x, that is an even function. That term is even. Okay, so we can integrate it on the interval from 0 to pi over 2 instead of doing minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. That's pretty great. Now sine cubed x. So really quick, just remember that sine to the 3 there x is just sine of x to the third power. So this, uh, this is just a little bit of notation to make everything a little bit easier since a lot of times we don't write the parentheses, we just write things like sine x. And if we just put the 3 outside, which would it be? It's ambiguous. That is, is sine x to the third written like this? Does this mean sine of x to the third or sine of x, the whole thing, to the third? So. If you write it with parentheses, it doesn't much matter, but let's get rid of all the needless parentheses, and that's why we write it with the little three next to the sign. So we know that we're cubing the whole thing and we're not taking the x and cubing it instead. So with that little diversion aside, 
we can just remember that sine is an odd function, and we're taking an odd function to an odd power. This is going to be an odd function. Basically, all we're saying is that if you take an odd function and you compose it with an odd function, you'll be good to go. So x to the third is an odd function, and we're basically just plugging sine of x into that function. So we'll preserve oddness. Oddness is preserved under composition with odd functions. Nice. Okay. So we got an odd function raised to an odd power, and this results in an odd function. So the integral of sine of x to the third on the interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 is 0. Very convenient. So with this in hand, we can run through the formal work and actually get our answer. We start out with that integral we have, the definite integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of cosine of x minus 4 times sine to the third x dx. We break that up using linearity. And oops, I think I have a 2 here where I don't need it. Or wait, nope, I'm good. I'm good. Into taking that first part, we've just split our integral in in half basically and we're going to double the result here for this first piece. We get 2 times the definite integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine of x dx. And this is just because cosine is an even function so we can just integrate it on the domain from 0 to pi over 2 instead and double our answer. Now I pull out that minus 4 in the second part and I just have the definite integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of sine of x to the third dx since sine of x to the third dx, or sine of x to the third is, or sine cubed x, is a odd function, what we've got is something that will integrate to zero. So all we got to do now is deal with this integral right there. So two times the definite integral from zero to pi over two of cosine of x dx. Well, I know that sine derives to cosine, so I'll get out two times sine of x evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. Okay, all I got to do is plug everything in. Sine of pi over 2, that's 1. Sine of 0 is 0, so I get 2 times 1 minus 0. And as we all know, that's just equal to 2. So there we go. That's the answer. We got 2 out. Hmm, pretty convenient. Kind of nice. Mostly it's this one that's so dang nice. We can just cut out odd terms. It's, it's amazing. You don't even have to think about them. Oh, it's an odd function, and it's on a symmetric interval about zero. Just throw it away. It's just going to be zero. The even ones, it's a little bit easier, mostly because a lot of functions, they're pretty straightforward to evaluate at zero. So, kind of nice. But yeah, there we go. On all levels except physical, I am a Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz.